It is truly an honor to be here. I was just telling Pastor Fernando, I had an encounter with God right under those steps right there during a conference. I was touched by the Holy Spirit, and uh, it's great to see some of you. Some of you are a little older. Uh, some of you are younger. Amen. Uh, let's open our Bibles today to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 4, and I'd like to more than share a sermon today, I'd like to open my heart, and uh, Pastor Fernando said, I am a son of this house, and I completely agree with him, so if I'm in the house, I'm going to open my heart and, and uh, to you, okay? Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there, can you say this with me, there... There, can you, can you say it like you had breakfast? There, I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and again we see there he was making something at a wheel, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter, to make. Now, if you go with me to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we hear the words of Paul, and he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, help us today. Do what I cannot do. Reveal Jesus Christ to us. Would you reveal Jesus Christ to us in such a way that we are transformed into his image? That is the work of the Holy Spirit. We welcome you today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. We just read a passage from the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah, and we read from the book of Ephesians. Remember, the Bible says that the Old Testament was the, uh, the shadow of the things to come, but then the New Testament is not a shadow anymore. It is the substance. And here in Ephesians, we see the words of Paul the Apostle. When he was taken up to heaven, he was taken to paradise, and God there shows him in a vision. He sees something he's never seen before in the spirit. He understands something he never understood before. And it actually changed the course of history for the church after this revelation. And I'm going to read it again from the New Living Translation. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things he planned for us long ago. And this is what I'd like to open my heart to you about today. I'm going to share something the Lord's been dealing with in my life for the past few weeks. I want to talk to you about God's workmanship. How does God work in our lives and how do we welcome the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives? We are, Paul said, God's masterpiece. Now, when I was in college studying uh, communications, there was two classes I hated. The first one was economics because he had a lot of math and numbers. And I never liked that. As a matter of fact, my dad took me one day. He was irritated. I don't know why. For some reason, he was irritated. And he took me to a college, and there was this this booth full of different careers you could choose out of. And he said, go, oh, pick, pick, so do something with your life. And so, so, so I had to, in five minutes, decide my future as he stood there watching me. So I'm, okay, I don't want to be an engineer. Wanna... So, you know, some people take years and pray and fast about this. No, I had five minutes. I had five minutes to think about this, so I ended up only opening him up, and I looked which one had that, this one had too much math, boom, out, too much math, out. Then I found communications, it only had economics, was one time I said, that is what I want to do with my life. But there was a second class I actually hated more than economics. It was called art. <laughs> How do you even grade that, whatever that is? 
What is the standard? I hated it. I hated it so much because it was so subjective. What, what you, well, well that, that's a great piece of art. Well, to me, it's awful. So how, what are we going to do? Do you get a hundred and I get a twenty? Who determines what's great and what's not? And here's the thing I, I, I really couldn't stand. You had all these people that they, they loved the art and they knew all the techniques and, and they would stand in front of a picture with the teacher and they would stare at it for like 30 minutes. That's all they would do. The only time I stared that long at something is when I met my wife, <laughs> who's eight years older than I am. She was one of the Bible teachers at my Bible school. That's why I graduated <laughs> with high honors. <laughs> my reward was a diploma, and I kept the teacher. <laughs> she, I, I, they, would, they would look at a... And then after 20 minutes, they would switch sides and then spend another 20 like this. I needed to pass the class to graduate, so I would stand with them and just stare with them. <laughs> Every now and then I would go, amazing, what a hand, what a hand. What? Unbelievable. But here's something I noticed. When people that actually knew art, not as ignorant as I am with art. They would look without them beforehand knowing who the artist was, just by looking at the technique, this is amazing to me, at the technique and the shadows and the way it is painted, they could tell you who painted that. It's amazing. And then I thought of the words of Paul. We are his masterpiece. You know, the thing is that in every work of art, there is something of the identity of the artist and his work of art. There's something manifested about the artist, about the identity, about the attributes of the artist that is manifested in that painting. Paul says, we are God's masterpiece. Therefore, that means that in each one of us, there is the identity, the mark of the identity of God himself in us. When I learned this, I started being more careful about criticizing other people. Because although I might not like the art, there's still God's workmanship. And I don't want to criticize God's artwork. Uh, some are an incomplete work of art. But it's up to God. You say this with me, we are his workmanship. So then we get to this passage of Jeremiah. And the first thing you notice is that God takes Jeremiah out of where he's at. Jeremiah was in a prophet, so therefore he lived in the temple. Prophets in the temple had a very nice room, a very nice office in the temple. It was very clean and neat, like my office. Just kidding, my office is a mess. And it was, everything was in its place, everything was nice. Then God says to Jeremiah, I need you to come out of where you're at and come down to the potter's house. Now, I noticed something. God's about to show Jeremiah a new revelation. God's about to show Jeremiah something he's never seen nor understood before, just like it happened to Paul in Ephesians. Actually, everything that Paul, a lot of, not everything, a lot of what Paul writes in his letters, he writes from prison. He writes from prison at a prison where 
Historians say that in his prison cell there was a, a little window where he would see the greatness of the Roman Empire through there. He would, he would look out and he would see all the horses, the chariots, people from all kinds of nationalities that were part of the empire and the greatness of the empire. Actually, in Paul's time, some historians say that there was a practice that the Romans had. They would get at two stadiums. I mean a stadium, just one stadium, and fill it up with gallons and gallons of water. And they would put two ships inside, like a boat, not, not, not ships, man, no, no. Inside the boats, and they would have them fight till one of them sank. My friend, that's something we would do in Texas. <laughs> that sounds like us. But what? Paul sees all of this, and... In that place, God reveals to Paul something he didn't see before if he didn't have that contrast, which is our citizenship is in the kingdom and it's greater than any citizenship on earth. When he saw the greatness of the Roman Empire, he said, God said, you see all that? That's nothing compared to my kingdom. And Paul now understands. Now, Jeremiah, Jeremiah is going through the same thing. He's taken out of where he's at. He's put in a different place. So by what, looking at his surroundings, looking at where God put him, he begins to understand some things he could not understand where he was at before. So he brings him out and it says, come down to the potter's house. And there he said, and there I'm going to show you something. Not there where you were before, but here. Now let's think about where Jeremiah comes and where he goes into. He comes from his nice, clean, tidy office. And he comes now into the office of a potter. Which is not necessarily that clean and nice. Think of a potter's working place. Full of humidity. Do you know what humidity is? Yeah, me too. It's been a decade in Houston. I know what humidity is. Full of clay, mud, water. And God tells Jeremiah, that's your nice little office. This is what my office looks like. And the first thing that God tells Jeremiah and begins to show him is that when God works in our life, he does not mind getting his hands dirty. When he works in our lives, he doesn't mind digging into every area of our lives, no matter how painful it is. From those areas of your life that you're so ashamed of that nobody knows, he gets in and works in them. Those areas of your life that you just choose to ignore because you can't change them, he works in them. God does not mind getting his hands dirty. Therefore, he gets into the messy parts. He has to things that are, that are maybe disgusting to others, things that we're not proud of. God will work in every area of our lives. That is the potter's office. Jeremiah, you're... Your office is really nice. Let me show you what the people business looks like. Let me show you what dealing with people is like. Let me show you what discipleship looks like. Discipleship can be messy. Because you're dealing with someone that's growing in their faith, that needs to mature, that needs to grow. There. What I'm going to show you, Jeremiah... You will not understand where you're at right now, where everything's so structured and great and awesome and clean and the way you would want it to be. I'm going to take you to a place that's different. And when you're there, you will understand how I work in people. I, you, I'm going to show you how I work in people's lives. Therefore, let's see what Jeremiah saw when he enters the potter's house. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to God's office. Welcome to the potter's house. This is where I would like us to go today. The potter house. He walks in. The first thing he finds is a potter's wheel. Now, we've seen movies. There are songs about the potter. There are 
documentaries, stories, different kinds of things. And, and, but th there's an interesting thing about the wheel here. He sees the wheel where the potter's working on the clay. But then he sees there's a second wheel. Actually, the ori original language in this verse doesn't say wheel. It says wheels. So there's more than one wheel. The first wheel... He uses to shape the potter, the, 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 the clay. And then on the second wheel, the potter had a pedal that would determine the speed at which the wheel would turn. Now Jeremiah begins to understand something different. He understands and begins to see now that God doesn't only work in our lives. He also determines at what speed he works in our lives. Have you ever wished he would kind of hurry things up? Have you ever gone, Lord, when is this season going to be over? And it seems like it's in slow motion. Sometimes, have you felt everything's going too fast? And you go, whoa, 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 Lord, bring it down a notch. I can't handle it. It is the potter what determines at what speed will he turn that wheel to work in your life. Now, here's a, here's a distinction I like to make. There are two kinds of vessels the potter can make. And actually, other parts in the New Testament and all throughout the Bible, you can see this. There are vessels that are useful. They have a purpose to carry something in them. And there were others that were not of good use they were not, uh, uh, they were useless. And they were used for decoration because they couldn't hold anything in them. So, the thinner the clay, the better quality the vessel. For the clay to be thin, it has to stay a long time on the wheel. The longer the clay is on the wheel, the thinner it is, and the better quality you'll get. The faster you go through it, you run a risk of it not being qual the, the vessel not being of good quality. How many times have we asked God, I am done with this process, and we just jump off the wheel. Because it's all fun and games until the potter begins to confront you with things you don't want to change. It's all fun and games until now you need to change certain approaches and thinking and attitudes in your own life. Oh, that's it. That, that, that. That's enough for me. This is too fast. This is too much. How many people we've seen jump off the wheel? Because God's not going to force you to stay on the wheel. I wonder if in the church today, I am proud to be an American citizen for many years now. I have two children born in Texas. I have an eight-year-old born in Texas and a seven-year-old born in Texas. I wonder, because I worry about the state of the nation that we're leaving for our children. And God help us what nation we're leaving to our grandchildren. But you know what? It's not politics' fault. Responsibility starts with the church. And it starts with the church, but not the walls of the church. The church. You and me. We are the church. And I wonder if we have churches now full of vessels that carry nothing. 
We have crowds full of decorated vessels, chairs full of decorated vessels that carry nothing. People that go to church but are not the church. Because we're called to more than just go to church, we're called to be the church. But in order to be the church, we must be filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We need to be carriers of the presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We need to be carriers of the living water of the Word of God. But I wonder if year after year, in the name of convenience, being comfortable, being politically correct, we little by little have generations jumping off the wheel saying, you know what, God, I'll take it from here. I don't want your dealings in my life. And we are great church goers, but they're decorative vessels because they wouldn't allow God to work in their lives even when it becomes uncomfortable. That's okay. We'll, we'll get to the amens later and all those on the exciting part, that's... <laughs> Chosen vessels. Chosen vessels that will not try to expedite God's work in their life. Microwave it. A chosen vessel is not never just for decoration. It is preserved for a special occasion, a special assignment, and an anointing for that specific assignment. A vessel that has allowed God to work in his life. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred, verse 4, in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. He didn't replace the clay. He made it again, and it was better. I like to make a parenthesis here. Some time ago, um, when I was younger, I heard someone say to me uh, in a message, yes, the, 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 the vessel is made again, the clay is worked on again, but it's never the same again. Well... I thought about it for some years, and that's not the God I encountered. When the God I encountered, when he restores, he restores even better than the first time. What he begins, he finishes. He who started the good work in us would be faithful to finish it. What do you mean it's not better? I mean, what do you mean it's not the same? Well, it's not the same because it's even better. God's restoration is always better. So let's, let's look at some examples throughout the Bible of People who've been through the potter's house. In Genesis chapter 1, we go to the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. See, we begin to see now that there is a clay. The clay is not good, yet in the next chapter, in chapter 2, God begins to work on that clay. He works on that clay that was void all over the place until he looks at it and he says, it is good. It is good. The earth went through the potter's house in Genesis 1. The Holy Spirit began to move. Began to give shape to things until one moment he said, there it is, perfect. It is good. How many of you know that when we say something is good, it's not the same standard as when God says something is good? We have a different standard. I have an eight-year-old daughter who will eventually, some boys will try to come and date her. But I will explain to them she's going to become a nun. <laughs> she won't. She, she's married to the Lord. But one of the first things my wife's going to ask is, is he a good boy? I'm not going to care because no one's a good boy for her. No one. Get away. But that's something we'll worry about later. 
the question is, whenever you're going to date someone, like I dated my eight-year-old wife, wife that's eight year older than I am, one of the first things her parents looked at is if I was a good boy. The question I ask you is, what's a good guy or guys a good girl? Define. You ask someone, what's good? Well, it's not bad. That's our standard. For God, the standard of good is different. When God looks at something and says, it is good, that means that that which that creation is fulfilling the purpose which I created it for. When it is fulfilling the purpose God created it to fulfill, it is good then. The standard is much higher. So God works on the earth until he looks at it and his standards, he goes, it is good. It is fulfilling the purpose it needs to be fulfilling. In the first chapter, he creates the clay out of the dust. He never gets rid of it. He works until it's delightful to his eyes. Genesis, the book of the beginnings. Everything, every truth in the book of Genesis is, is uh, you can find in the form of a seed. And there we can begin to see how God works, how the potter works. Then we move on in the Bible and we see Adam and Eve shaped, created and shaped by God Himself, got formed. Man, but all of a sudden, that clay gets marred by sin and choices. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. God shapes man out of the dust, but now they find themselves again in the potter's house. Marred clay. To Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Everything ruined. Marred. Yet, we see... God began to work on that marred clay called humanity. And he's been working until the fulfillment of Jesus Christ eventually is the redemption. But we begin to see it because out of Adam and Eve, marred clay, there's two sons. That, one of them, not good, we'll talk about him, Cain. But out of this marred clay, a son is born named Abel. And Abel presented a perfect sacrifice to God. So notice how God begins to work in such a way that out of this marred clay, now there comes a son that offers a sacrifice that is pleasing to God. You know what God did when he saw Abel's offering? He said, it is good. This is what I'm intending for. This is the purpose I have. You move, you move on, and you begin to see how God now begins to work. He takes humanity through the potter's house. Abraham. How many of you remember Abraham? Everybody remembers. We used to sing in Sunday school, Abraham, the father of the faith. But no one told us he's a liar too. No one, no one added to the song, he was a liar, but anyways, we like Abraham. No. <laughs> no one told me he had issues growing up. He was also a cheater. But God works in this man's life. And he shaped a man who eventually obeyed God and was pleasing to him and inherited all. The promises of God. Hmm. Jacob. Oh, what a jewel. 
Jacob, his name means the supplanter. Supplanter is someone that is always trying to take someone else's place. This is what Jacob wanted. He wanted his brother's place. The reason Jacob was going through that is because he had a lack of identity. The, people, the, the reason people always are trying to be someone else is because they don't know their identity. Jacob had no need to go after his brother's identity because he, he, he didn't even need his brother's blessing. He was blessed from his mother's womb. There was a declaration over his life before he was even born. God was going to fulfill it. He didn't, he didn't have an identity. It was a lack of identity. Lack of identity will cause you to always be running away. Yet, God encounters Jacob at Bethel. And he changes his name. He changes his name to Israel. I want to point something out here. El, E-L, means God. If you were to, if you were to go to Bethlehem, you're going to find a lot of bread because Beth means house, Lehem means bread. That's why Bethlehem, it's house of bread. Beth means house, El means God, Bethel means house of God. El means God, Ohim means plural. That's why the El Ohim said, let us make man into our image. He was the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit speaking. El. Now God looks at Jacob and he says, now I'm going to change your name. You see the potter working. You shall be called Israel. Prince of God. The interesting thing is that after that encounter, one of the names of God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He gives, notice what he did. He gave Jacob his name. And he took Jacob's name. Isn't that what he did at the cross for us? He gave us his righteousness. And he took our sin. By the way, I saw you also pray for prodigals here. I want to tell you, never give up on a prodigal son. Because God, one of his names is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's. He's still the God of Jacob's. He's still the God who reaches those running away from him, encounters them, and changes them. That's what his presence does. Actually, David in Psalms 20, he would say, May the God of Jacob hear you. Why would he say the God of Jacob? The God of Jacob is the God who chases those that run away from him until he transforms them. Never give up. Jacob went to the potter's house. I won't stay here long, but how about Elijah? Oh, what a great, powerful man of God. Yet in James chapter 5, verse 17, I saw a verse. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. What? The prophet had my issues. Think about this. Bible says Elijah had some of the issues you have and some of the issues I have. But if God can do work in Elijah, then there's hope for us. Hallelujah. But the verse doesn't end right there. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. It's a guy with issues. We're talking about a guy with issues. Issues like you have and like I have. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes we look at this, this man, these heroes of the faith, and we think they're perfect. They were not. Elijah had same issues as you do. That's the New John translation. 
Yet God shaped a man with such authority that with his prayers he could open up the heavens and close them. What is that? That is the work of the potter in a life. Oh, this one. But I'm not going to stop a lot because this one gave us material for, we, we could be here till the final judgment. David. <laughs> Want to talk about issues? David. David. A lot of people remember David for his sin of adultery. This was awful, created a lot of issues and problems. But you know that the, 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 the sin that David committed that offended God the most was not the sin of adultery that he created. It was something uh, when he did something called, and I hope I pronounce it right, a census, where they count, census, where they count all the people. David one morning woke up and he said, I'm, I'm going to count how many people I have in my kingdom. He was full of arrogance and pride because he didn't want to know how many families he had. He wanted to know how many fighting men he had. He wanted to know the strength of his army. He wanted to know the strength of his chariots, his horses, his military, his economic power. He wanted to see the strength of, 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 of his own kingdom and his own reign. His advisors, his staff, the people that work with him, even the prophet, his own pastor, said, David, you're messing this one up. What you're about to do is going to really, really bother God because God has been with you when you fought the bear, when you fought the lion, when you defeated Goliath, when, you, when, you, when, when he protected you from your father-in-law Saul that chased you for 14 years. And now, when you are king, when you are reigning, when you've seen God's faithfulness, you're going to turn around and see if you can depend on your own resources. David, you're about to really offend God. This will bring judgment on our nation. David did not care. That's what happens when you're full of pride and arrogance. The way you think and what you think is the only thing that matters. He despises the counsel of people around him, and he finally goes and does that. He does his senses. He, he has it his way. The problem with that is, sure enough, judgment came. And now they give David three options of judgment. Says David, first the prophet comes and says, Here's, you can, you get, at least he gets the option of how to get judged. He gets three options. The first one is, there's going to be hunger all across the earth, all across your kingdom. Nope, I don't want that. The second one is you're going to be defeated for months by your enemies. Well, someone that's full of pride and arrogance will never want to be defeated by their enemies. The third one is the angel of the Lord will pull out his sword and will begin destruction in your nation. He chooses that one. Then we see the story takes us to the patio, the backyard of a guy named Hornan the Jebusite. That guy had nothing to do with what David did. Yet, for some reason, the angel stood at his backyard to begin destruction and judgment upon the nation. Now, can you imagine God's going to destroy your nation and he chooses to start on your backyard? Think of this guy. He comes out in the morning to probably with a cup of coffee to check his plants, see how the trees are growing, if there's, if there's fruit coming out, if it's the season. He's probably having a wonderful morning. He's, I wonder if he was whistling. And all of a sudden, he looks down and he sees these massive feet. There's a giant. The angel of the Lord, the one that executes judgment on behalf of the Lord. Just imagine how big that sword was. <laughs> he turns around and he sees David with his whole team and the chariots and the horses running towards his. Wait! Hernan, wait! So he waits. David gets there. All right, here's the thing. I messed up. There's judgment. This is going to be... A bloodbath, this is going to be awful. I need 
to offer sacrifice to the Lord and make an altar right here. Ornan says, you know what, brother, with this angel, won't you keep it? I'll give it to you with the whole angel and everything. You can keep the land. He says, no, you don't understand. I need to buy it because that's the way sacrifice and altars work. It needs to cost me something. So he buys the land, and David now creates an altar. And something very unusual happens. Fire came on that altar. You might say, well, glory to God, fire on an altar. Yeah, except one thing. God's fire means God's approval. David knew that. He looks at the fire on the altar. David says, put a little bit more, see what happens. They put some more. Some of you woke up. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> Talking about David. He looks, says, you know what? Put some more. <laughs> David realized this is working. Not only that, the angel of the Lord puts the sword away. Oh, I can picture David. <laughs> put some more, put some more. <laughs> put a little more, put a little more. Zip it up. <laughs> now, there's fire on this altar. 30 kilometers from there is Moses' tabernacle. Where all the structure, the manuals, the how-tos, everything you ought to do like this, all the, all the religious structure, everything was there, but there was no fire there. The fire was where a man that was confronted by the potter decided to repent. The fire of God came. You want the fire of God in your life? An altar of repentance will always bring the fire of God. One of the oldest versions of the Bible called the Celiac Version. He, it reads that verse like this. It says that the angel of the Lord, when he saw the ashes of of Abraham's Psalter when he was going to sacrifice Isaac, he put his sword away. That means it was in that same spot where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. The angel realized he was standing on redemption. He put the sword away. That's where David ends up building the temple. Not there, where all the structure was. Where all the, this is exactly how you got to do it was. No. It was where there was a sincere, repentant heart. The fire came. And David builds the temple there, there where the glory of God will come and dwell. And in that same geographic location... It's where Christ died and saved the world. You could write a book about just that piece of land. It's amazing. Don't write it. I just, we, I just got that idea. It'd be plagiarism. I need to send my kids to college. Please don't write it. <laughs> Let me write it. Okay. But in that same place... There's a group of men, afraid, hiding, and they begin to pray, seek the Lord, and the Holy Spirit descends. The rest is history. Church exploded. Acts chapter 2. That same spot. Do you know what it all started with? It started with someone surrendered to the potter. Let's move on to the next one. Oh, Peter. 
I'm jumping a little bit more, so we're not here till the final judgment, okay? So because we, you can find this all over the Bible, okay? So, so you can tell I jump from David to Peter. Peter, my goodness, what a huge mouth that guy had. Have you ever met someone that just can't not be quiet? I hope you're not saying that of me right now. I'm, that, that's why I jumped to Peter, guys. So insecure, my goodness. Jesus would tell Peter, Peter, this is what I need you to do. The first thing Peter would go, well, what about him, Lord? What is he going to do? Peter, shut up! Do what you're asked to! Why do you care what they're doing? I'm talking to you! That's the new John version. God, Peter, there's about a process to start in your life. You're going to deny me. But no, Lord, no, no, no. That's them, not me, me, never. Sure enough, happened. They came to go, they, 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 the, the um, Romans come to get Jesus Christ. What does Peter do? Pulls out his sword and chops one of the Romans' ears. Jesus knew exactly what was happening and what needed to happen. Can you imagine Jesus' frustration picking up that ear? Oh, Peter, come on. I'm sorry, man. And just puts it back. And he got the ear, but he was not trying to go for the ear. The guy moved. You know what he was aiming at, right? The head. Yet... Something happens because the Peter that stands up and speaks in the book of Acts is a different man. If you read first and second Peter, it is like a completely different person writing. It's a transformed man by the potter. Someone who was shaped in the potter's house. And embraced the process of God even when it was uncomfortable and decided to not jump off the wheel. Someone that decided to let the work of the cross in his life, someone that was completely radical, radically transformed by an encounter with the resurrected Christ. The potter's house. There's another one I like. His name was John Mark. John Mark was kind of like Paul's assistant. He was the nephew of Burnaby. Of Burnaby? Bernabas. Burnaby, yeah, him. Him and Paul. How about that? Him and Paul were working together, two men that were destined to be partners in ministry. But now this nephew, John Mark, comes in. He's working for Paul. And, oh, John Mark is the greatest in sliced bread, right? He was amazing, like, because every broom works great when you just first buy it, right? But all of a sudden... When things began to get difficult, when things began to get rough, John Mark said, never mind, I don't want to be in ministry. Paul got really mad. Of course, everybody wants to be a missionary if they send you to Cancun. <laughs> if I make an altar call and say, you know what, the Lord wants us to take Bahamas for him, hey, this place will be filled. <laughs> the Cayman Islands, yeah. But... John Mark, when he got difficult, he, he, he got off the boat. He, he said, I'm not going. He, 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 he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He didn't want to pay the price. So that creates conflict with Paul. Paul had, did not want anything to do with this guy. Actually, they split up because of John Mark. Paul and his partners split up because of John Mark. Yet something happens in the last days of the life of Paul. When Paul is approaching the end, 
he surprises everyone by turning around and saying, I need John Mark. I wonder if his staff was around Paul and they said, you need who? John Mark. John Mark? I thought he was a wimp. Something must have happened in the life of John Mark. For now, for Paul now to say, I need to work with him. I need him in my ministry. Actually, some versions, even in Spanish, say, John Mark is useful to me. Wait a minute. Not long ago, he called him useless. Obviously, God had done something in the life of John Mark that Paul was not worried about him not wanting to pay the price anymore. There was a maturity. It was a process that has shaped and transformed John Mark. All these vessels went to the potter's house and allowed God to work in them. And the grace of God transformed them. But let me look at some vessels that did not allow God to work in him. Cain. Cain refused to be shaped. When God gave him the opportunity to come back with the right offering, he did not repent. He got mad and offended and killed his brother out of envy. My friends, envy will make you jump off the wheel. Esau. Esau rejected the grace of God. And when he was older, he cried and wanted to be restored, but he had a root of bitterness. Bitterness, my friends, will make you jump off the wheel. Saul. Saul did not allow God to work in his life because he was too worried about what people would say about him. Paul, uh, Saul forgot the fact that we all live for an audience of one. And that one day we will give account to one. That is God. Seeking man's glory will make you jump off the wheel. Judas. Judas is, I, I, it's hard to believe for me. He saw everything. He saw the miracles, the signs, the wonders. You know what the problem was with him? His love for money was greater. Is it, is it wrong to have money? No. Please. Have a lot of it. The love of money is what got Judas. Out of the wheel. The interesting thing about Judas is he committed suicide on the potter's field. You know what the potter's field is? It's that place where all those broken pieces of pottery that were not useful were thrown. He hanged himself, jumped on the potter's wheel. His love of money was so great, he couldn't understand the purposes of God for himself. So, that was the introduction. Let me start preaching. <laughs> for real. If you can give me some. Here's the message today. It's actually a very simple message. Will you stay on the wheel? Or will you jump off? God is looking for his church again. You know what this nation needs? You know what the hope of this nation is? For chosen vessels to arise again.
full of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But you can't produce those in a factory or in a class or in a membership class. Those are shaped by God Himself. As long as you allow Him. You know what would change America? Less decorated vessels sitting in the pews and more chosen vessels full of the anointing. We've gotten to use that to the fact that we, 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 we think that the only chosen vessel is the one standing here. The whole church should be the chosen vessel. Chosen vessels are, are, are created, shaped, formed for a specific purpose. Each one of the persons that belong to the church of Jesus Christ has a purpose. You know, little by little we've got into the self-help movement coaching I don't know what else the power within you there's no power within you without God seven keys to this eight points to that eight strategies for this and that we need to let the Holy Spirit work in our lives not only when it feels good but also when he confronts you with those things that need to change How do you stay on the wheel? This is the message, this next sentence. It is a posture of your heart. The Lord's been dealing personally with me in this regard. He said, John, it's a posture, an attitude of the heart. And if you don't walk in it, it will be the beginning of your end. I'm never going to forget. When you think you have it all figured out, be careful. Walk in a constant dependence on God every single morning is the only way to make it in the Christian life. You know what the attitude is? You can find it in Psalms 51. A daily attitude and approach. Be gracious to me, O oh God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Watch me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. And in the hidden part, you will make me no wisdom. Purify me with his up, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me. A clean heart, O oh God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. It's our only hope for the church to welcome the work of the cross again. What happens when God asks you to Make some changes in your life and you don't like them. So what, is that it? Is that where it all stops? Is that where it all ends? No more growth in the Lord because I don't like this. The moment we think we got it all figured out is the beginning of our end. Every morning, have mercy on me. Create in me a pure heart, a clean heart, God. Did you know you can't create a clean heart within yourself? It's only the work of the Holy Spirit. 
Somehow we got into this notion that's always fun and games. Sometimes it's painful. There's no transformation without the cross. And sometimes to encounter the cross is to encounter yourself. And when you encounter yourself, you're always shocked at what you find because you're not who you thought you were. But that's the beginning of the potter's work. A daily attitude. The way of the cross. A total an absolute dependence on God every single minute every single moment David was confronted by the prophet and after this sin you know what he did he repented and he began to experience a broken heart before the Lord. To stay on the wheel, you must always recognize that you need Him. You know, the Bible is the potter's house and it starts with the air that is void and without form, but God has been restoring it. The last book of the Bible we see how God makes a new heaven and a new earth. In the first book of the Bible, we see the tree of life, which man despises. He doesn't even want it. The last book of the Bible, we see a city. And in the middle of that city, we see a tree of life. And out of that tree flows healing to the nations. You can find the potter working all throughout. Genesis through Revelation. So, it's all I got. But I think I think we I think we ought to take a moment where we're at to surrender to the Lord one more time. To maybe close your eyes you want lift your hands and respond